when people asked about expertise about Bitcoin and then Ethereum, I was the only person in the whole floor who could articulate it better than anyone else in that building. Our guest today is Jay Kurahashi Sofue, the CMO at Ava Labs. He is a professional street photographer and a previous electronic music DJ and festival organizer. What's one of the biggest learning that you learned in all these years in the crypto space? I would say yes to everything. When I was in high school, early, early college, I realized, hey, I'm not actually doing any of these things that well. I started to kind of step back and say, okay, what are the actual priorities? How should I actually maximize this? What helped is I can get the lay of the land and really understand, okay, this will probably reap a ton of benefit. This probably won't. Put like 3K into that. The thing went so crazy in three days. The meme coin itself became 100,000 bucks. What's the thing that you decided to prioritize? Marketing profession, music, a little bit of DJing, photography in 2017. I ended up getting hired as a head of marketing for a company called Fluidity. Why marketing if you're a nerd? Yeah, okay, so... Because I grew up with really bad sleep problems, I always thought, oh, well, it's just part of my life and I can function anyways, which is kind of a backwards way of looking at it, actually. I don't understand why people give so much importance to money. Money is just numbers on a screen. Crypto is like a lottery. You're winning a lottery ticket tonight, so you made it. And the day after, you lost the ticket, so you can't redeem your money. Numbers on a screen, we as humans can't process that. Mm -hmm. It just looks like a game because it's not real. What does the future of Avalanche look like? Yeah, seven podcast today, podcast number two. Have to see it as a as an after hour DJ session. Which yeah. reminds me, but that was a long time ago. I was DJing when I was 16 to 21 years old. Now I'm 31. Prime years for for after hours. Yeah, but but the, the thing is like to do that every weekend, like you need to be young, otherwise Pretty much. it's impossible. Yeah, like it's impossible. Now, I will, now I'll go out once and I'm dead You're for three dead days. For, yeah. So but I remember going trying out I did three times going to multiple locations in one evening yeah but obviously I was uh, I was doing intros for like Avicii and a few DJs but I was not a big DJ you know so I was taking my car right and I was barely 18 I was taking my car going from one place to another like I remember one time from the second to the third location it was probably 3am yeah on the 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 highway with music super loud, like open the window so it's a bit more cool, but I was like falling asleep, like, you know, and um, th that that day I realized, oh man, that's not good. That's not good. Like, I'm not going to do that anymore because it's too yeah. risky. And also, I don't have any pleasure do do doing that. It doesn't no. bring me any joy. You do you do one thing bet at, at your best instead of like trying to do everything and trying to get money there and like kind of FOMOing into things. Same thing in crypto. You don't want to yeah. FOMO into 50 different projects. But you got to, I feel like you have to experience that firsthand in order to kind of save yourself a little bit, right? Absolutely. Not to max out too too late in the game. You know, some people don't see that in the beginning and they're like, max, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. And and you burn out. Everybody does that. Yeah. Do you have some examples? I feel like I I, I mean I kind of have similar examples with with music a little bit and maybe photography. I used to book gigs back to back to back to back. And was I, it because of the money? Or because of like the FOMO, like I, if I say no to this one, yeah. I'm not going to be able to get this chance ever again. It wasn't about the money, but I was just an opportunist, right? And yeah. I think that's with everything. So it's like, I would say yes to everything when I was in like kind of kind of that age, late late high school, early early college, and then right after college, probably a little bit. Yeah. And then realized, hey, I'm not actually doing any of these things that well. I'm doing all of these pretty pretty mediocre And yeah. and then that's when I think I started to kind of step back and say, okay, what are the actual priorities? How should I actually maximize this? What helped is I can get the lay of the land and really understand, okay, just by looking at it, this will probably reap a ton of benefit. This probably won't. And so now, you know, 10, 10, 15 years later, I'm looking at things and I'm like, don't even have to try it. I just know, okay, let's just not deprioritize. Let's prioritize this. So what were these things that you were doing at the same time? And what's the thing that you decided to prioritize? Yeah. So the main things that I think there, there, there's all these different categories. So there's like marketing profession, music, a little bit of DJing too, photography for DJs, producing events, um, and then probably like friendships, relationships, all these things and, on and the side. And sometimes sleeping. Yeah, One sometimes sleeping. here and there. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking about sleeping because I grew up with really bad sleep problems. Okay. And so I think I always thought, oh, well, it's just part of my life and I can function anyways which is kind of a backwards way of looking at it, actually. Did you solve that? Yeah, I, I don't think I solved it completely, but I have ways to cope. And I think I have um, a much more healthy outlook 
of sleep and rest and preserving that, giving it its it it its space, right? But how how much of a pillar it is in your life, basically? It's, it's a basic. It's pretty important. If, yeah, if you don't have yeah. that kind of under control, the rest is gonna pretty can, much can compound positively. Yeah, when I when I'm at the... home, it's it's perfect almost. It's really good. Like I I don't get like too much sleep to be honest, but I get more than I used to. What do you get? I used to get like four or five. Now I get like seven probably. That's good. Consistently, yeah. And and why do you do that? Like complete darkness, complete darkness, you know, white noise machine. Blindfold. Okay. Like n kind of like minimize uh, electronics before uh, and even after to, when you wake up to just to like have better hygiene. That's not perfect. We lit work in cryptos. It's not always perfect, but it's better than before. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like also like I don't drink nearly as much. I'm not a huge drinker really. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like just being very uh, mindful of the hygiene. And, and before it was again, just like sleep didn't have a pillar. So the way I've now categorized the pillars is I have three focus areas. One is work, right? We have to eat. That's the idea. So work for us or for me, for me in this case is is marketing and crypto. That's kind of the main thing I'm focusing on right now. And that's... Is work number one or is sleep number one? Sleep is kind of... It's sleep is number one. Okay. But it kind of sits underneath everything. So if sleep's not addressed, then none of the three priorities I'm about to name... It's like a layer zero. Focused. Yeah. No, it really <laughs> is. And then the second piece is creativity because I've realized I am super type A and I like that uh, kind of more left brain focus, but I also need kind of the creative focus as well. For happiness? Yeah, like just for, for fulfillment. feel happy and... Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's kind of uh, for the last three, four years of photography. And I kind of deprioritized music because you can't do music and photography both well. Mm. Music has a much steeper learning curve, in my opinion. Photography is still insanely steep, but at least I found a lot more success there. And I'm, I was like, okay, let's just focus on that and, and continue to go level two, level three, level four. Mm. And then the last focus is really, well, I'm extroverted. So I realized where I get energies from people. And so intimate relationships, uh, just friendly, platonic relationships, professional relationships, kind of get all get bucketed in there. Mm. And it's kind of a push and pull, right? So if work is really intense, then I got to be really mindful of pulling back down on the other two because it's all pulling from the 100% pool. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm pulling, again, like full stops, which I have done before, then the layer zero gets totally screwed. And and same with the reverse is true. So like even the last few years, I've been much more focused on crypto. I've kind of started to try to buy back that time a little bit more. But even in that two or three year stint, I was thinking to myself, okay, this is short term. That's okay. I'm going to make that sacrifice. And maybe the creativity or the relationships thing will kind of take a second second mm -hmm. seat. But um, I know it's short term and, and that's where I, I'm a little bit more healthy about it. If it's not short term, then that's a problem because then I'm not balancing my life properly, I think. Thank God we have these uh, cycles, bull market, bear market, yeah. where we're kind of forced to get back to a normal life because the bear market is boring as fuck <laughs> and depressing. So you need to find happiness and the dopamine, the healthy dopamine and endorphins from other things than crypto. Right. Well, that's kind of why the balance is important. And I think it's worked so well. Like I've, I've kind of stuck to the system for the last five to seven years, not too long, but long enough. Before that, it was great. But again, I saw like things deteriorating my health or whatever it may mm. be, not in like extreme ways, but ways where I was like, okay, I'm not happy with this outcome at all. Let's figure out how to fix it. And at the end, it's always a priorities issue, right? And so now moving forward, next five years, I might be looking at, okay, maybe I want to focus more on a creative endeavor. So I want to juice that up a little bit more. Um, maybe because of the bull, the bear market too, it might make sense to focus on that a little bit more while I also still focus on crypto and marketing, of course, but find ways to kind of balance. And maybe you can also kind of cheat your way to balance that a little bit by asking for help, getting more resources. And so I think there's ways around it, but it's still, again, very, very straightforward of there's a whole pie you kind of have to take down from that. And if you try and seek more, that's when you're going to start to stumble. So you said you had all these different uh, priorities at once, which was way too much. And then you said, I'm going to focus on work. I mean, obviously sleep, work, creativity, but the creativity will be more photography than music. Yeah. Right. So now it's mostly photography. I mean, sleep, photography, work and work is yeah. crypto. Essentially, essentially. I've, I've kind of even let a little bit less of a focus on um, photography these days and then kind of pushed more on some of the side endeavors that are part of work a little bit, but not really, you know, it's kind of this own pillar of like, doesn't pay the bills, but could, and still kind of early ideation. For example. Um, so I've been really interested in this idea of opening up a music venue in, in New York. 
Oh, nice. And I think you would relate to that, but I want to do it properly. And I want to do it where the loose theme that I've kind of been talking about is I don't want capitalistic uh, pressures to have to force this environment, this experience in a way, uh, in, in the direction that most New York venues kind of steer towards just by sent by kind of the essential economics of the whole thing, right? Especially in the creative industry, you can feel it directly. Yeah. If the priority is great, obviously the thing needs to be profitable exactly. at some point, but you can feel if the place has like culture and where the, 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 the key spot is for creativity and culture and music in this yeah. case, or if it's a money-making machine. Mm -hmm. You can feel it as a customer directly. Exactly. And I feel like to start, I don't really care for the money-making machine side, which is an amazing place to be. Yeah. Um, but there has to be other mechanics to kind of keep that culture alive because at the end of the day, success kind of brings on that capitalistic pressure and it's hard to sometimes kind of push it away. And that's where I think you kind of have to make a common purpose for the people that are attending and eventually... I think it all the rest will follow is is what I'd like to think at least. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much, but what would this place look like? This venue would it be like concerts? Would it be DJ? Would it be electronic music? Because I know you love electronic music. Would it be yeah a variety of different type of music? So far, pretty open. I think it'll probably stick to underground electronic for now, mm -hmm. just to give it that space. Um, I, I really take a page out of the Berlin night scene they do an incredible job. Think about you show up to any club in Berlin, you pay 10 euros max, and that's always what it is. And there's still a five hour line. In New York City, yeah. there's a five hour line because no one can afford the $5,000 tables. Mm. It's a two different outcome, two different, very, yeah. very unique outcomes, right? One is, again, driven by money, and the other is dr driven by culture, by FOMO. Um, there is obviously FOMO on both sides. But in my mind, I think the cultural FOMO is much better than the capitalistic one. So an opening night with the Martinez brothers. <laughs> Maybe even then, like, I kind of want to keep it even lower key for now because yeah. I want uh, what, so there's a club called Sisyphus in, in Berlin. I know I've been there for, uh, actually I've been there for New Year's Eve, 2013. Yeah. Magical place. Is, is the place with the multiple. Yeah. It looks like a, you get lost. It looks like, like a Western saloon, kind of like a US, like, like yeah. American kind of old Western. Exactly. Place, all wood. And then you go outside, you go to this other place and then you go outside and there's these different houses yeah. and you're just there like, where, where the hell am I? Like, yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. Like I'm lost in this little village. Yeah. And, and, and DJs will take bookings like $1,000, $2,000 or 1,000 euro, 2,000 euro booking fees. Or sometimes they pr play free because it's such a really? coveted place to be. Like the big DJs, they go there and yeah. almost, that's amazing. And, and, then, you, okay. and then also think about the attendance. When you show up, you have no idea who's playing. You just know, hey, I want to be at Sisyphus. It's going to be amazing, yeah. Or whatever else. other clubs in, the, in, in Berlin have this too. But this so is the one. The branding of the club versus yeah. the branding of the DJ or the artist coming Exactly. There. And if you create a safe space, a create uh, an environment, that I think the core community people or the core evangelists want to be a part of, then it gets protected. And then all of a sudden it's like, it, there's this snobbiness to it, of course, right? Cultural snobbiness, which I'm kind of playing into, but hopefully it doesn't get too carried away. That's the whole idea. So I think experientially it is open for anyone who doesn't necessarily like underground music, because I think that's a little bit prohibitive. You know, not everyone wants to do like 125, 130 BPM with no lyrics and whatever. Mm. So there's there's a space in New York called Public Records. They're, they actually do an incredible job. Uh, it's kind of the similar model where there's a musician involved in the partnership. There's like a, a kind of a, a capitalist involved as well. There's also a bunch of cultural advocates involved. There's all these different types of people. And so it's welcoming to the everyday. But if you want to go to the back room, which has like a four point sound system, incredible sound system, all the su super intense music heads will also find a home. So you can kind of step in, step out. And so when I go there, I go, I can bring my friends who have never listened to techno ever, maybe. And they might also find it interesting and not super overwhelming, but it also I can bring some of my, you know, super club head friends and they'll also have a great time and so i feel like that inclusivity it's like 300 person cap uh, capacity not too big super intimate that has a lot of legs the minute you open it up and you go okay we're gonna pump a 30 40 tickets it's over yeah so kind of that balance so sort of letting down a bit the electronic side creative i mean electronic music side to go to photography to now going back to music yeah kind of yeah and the entire time it's like i can you know i I'm, i feel like i mean it's all linked also yeah because exactly you can you can you can i mean obviously like all these events you want to show them somewhere and like yeah. the better you are at production and photography 
yeah, like actually today, photography and production and this type of stuff is like the, the, the new way to market things. Exactly. Crazy. So I can, from the photography side, I have much more empathy with the designers, the creative directors. I can work with them much more closely. Mm -hmm. I always come to the table and say, hey, I'm, an, I'm a fellow artist as well. I understand this. And so I'm not going to be that helicopter marketing leader who is saying, hey, this has to be like this. This has to be like this. We can make it more of a collaboration. On the other hand, on the music side, we've been producing a lot of events for Avalanche. Basically, all the past contacts I've made in the music, in my music life, have kind of come back. And we're, I'm going to go up to them and say, hey, by the way, we're doing an event in Korea. We're doing an event in Barcelona. Do you want to play it? And they come to me and say, oh, interesting. Crypto event? We, you want like an underground DJ? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, now here's why. And then kind of that's where the stage And then you can link set. smartly, which we've done already, because one of your friends is blondish. So you can link you can say, okay, come play at my event. Right. But then you can say, hey, you're an artist. There's this NFT stuff that's going to be something big. And hey, here's a way you could, you could leverage NFTs or crypto. Yeah. You think you're just coming to play here, but I'm going to explain you how crypto can help you in your artistic career. Yeah. Can you give an example with, for example, Blondish or other people you know that you basically matched with blockchain to try to do something that's better for them, their brand and their community? Yeah, so funny enough, Viv is like super into crypto. So that was less about like me saying, hey, this is something interesting. You should t check it out. She was already already like at an ins insane expert level, which mm -hmm. is why I think we we kind of have meshed pretty well over the last few years. There are a few other artists. Um, I, I would say it's less about like, hey, this is the new thing, but it's more like, hey, this is what we're working on. And here's why Avalanche might be better than the use cases that you've seen. Mm -hmm. And and also instead of saying, hey, this is the solution for you, it's more like this is potentially the solution for you. Is there something we can work out? Is there something we can maybe pivot or flex a little bit to make it work for you? And so you actually get right in front of the customer, right? And you go, hey, music NFTs, BS or not? Is it uh, PFPs, BS or not? And instead of minting it or going through building it out and selling it and seeing if these artists come on board, you can actually start to validate or invalidate your product direction mm. way before it's even public. Absolutely. And so I think that to me has helped so much, not just in product development, but it's also investing, understanding the market, where people are. It's just really all about information gathering and trying to get as many touch points as possible so you can make an informed decision, whichever direction you end up going. How's the product roadmap changed? Regarding these, uh, yeah, so these feedbacks. I think one of the programs that we launched early this year, it's been kind of in the works for almost a year now, is this program called Avasans. I think we might have talked about it before, and it's an artist grants program, bare bones. But when you actually lift it up, it's focused on up and coming artists who really want to try blockchain technology, but don't really know how. And so you have people, so there's kind of the same friend circles as Viv, but there's a there's a, a friend, I have a friend, his name is Gio. He's in deeply in the music space. He's also deeply in crypto. He was one of the um, leaders and he's basically picking a handful of grantees effectively and saying, I'm going to teach music curriculum. We'll go from zero all the way up to one, two, three, four, and go up the level. And hopefully by the end of the program, you'll have at least a few or even just one artist saying, hey, by the way, this whole program has helped me shape the direction that we go in. And so to your question, the way that's shaped our direction is we've worked so closely with these artists to say, hey, what's your ideal program? And everyone is fascinated, super bullish on this. And so there's not really one particular thing I could say that it changed. It changed the whole program. But the outcome that it enabled us to do is a much more successful outcome. Mm. Because now you have all these OG, legit artists that are saying, hey, these guys are not just here for the quick cash grab. They're willing to sponsor us even to make our dreams a reality. And then in turn, the people that follow us, that look up to us, can also have their dreams come to fruition. And so that's kind of the collaborative spirit that I think we've really harnessed, which I don't think really was there before as much, I think. How do you think an artist who is interested by this crypto, blockchain, NFT stuff? Okay, maybe not this year because last year was not great, but it's going to happen again next year in two years. How do you think they can, especially if they don't understand crypto? So let's say they're not a crypto DJ. And yeah. Which a lot of DJ, if you look at a bunch of DJ, even the DJs I used to like kind of follow 10 years ago, a lot of them in crypto, you yeah, see them like crypto DJs. But if they're not, and if they're not are DJs, but like artists, they want to, to experiment with NFTs. How do they do that without damaging their brand? 
because it's, at the end of the day, it's very risky. Yeah. And that's why a lot of influencers, I mean, influencers, artists, 2021, they came and then they, real, and then they tried something. A bunch of them probably won't realize, oh, I can make some money quickly. Yeah. But probably, probably most of them, I would hope, have their communities or fans' best interest at heart and didn't want that, but realized, oh man, I launched this thing, but like, I didn't even have time to build some inherent value to my community, my NFT, that the entire thing crashed and now everybody got wrecked and yeah. I look bad, right? Yeah. How, so how can an artist experiment with NFTs without screwing their own fans? You kind of mentioned it while you were even phrasing the question, it was really about get rich quick schemes. If it feels like that, it's probably a red flag, right? And as much as it is tempting, you have to really understand you're going to burn your whole fan base and you might even take one whole step back or a few steps back. I feel like there are a ton of artists that have gone through that path, of course, but there's also a ton of artists who may have considered that, but also then realized, okay, like how do uh, the, the rabbit hole an analogy, right? They, mm. they went down the rabbit hole and realized, okay, get rich quick was really what captured my attention, but there's so much more than that. This is a classic in crypto, actually. Yeah. You see the price of the <laughs> coins go up. That's why you go in there. You're like, oh, I'm going to become rich overnight. Yeah. Then you get wrecked overnight. And, and then, then you like, look into staying, it. Ah, this is interesting, actually. Yeah. No, so, I mean, that's how it is, right? You got to you gotta just get in there deeper than, than being on the surface layer. So if you don't understand what you're doing, look into it a little bit more. Mm. And I think that's a check for everybody, even, even me, even you, right? And so... That's kind of where I get to find a little bit more depth and then get into it, right? If if you're picking anything else in the world, if you're about to, let's pick F1 because it's this weekend. If someone's like, hey, you want to drive this F1 car, you're not just about to floor it, right? No one's ever going to do that. You might actually look into, you might ask questions, you might ask professional drivers being like, hey, how do I actually quit myself so I don't totally wreck this multi-million dollar car? It's the same idea. But unfortunately, I think numbers on a screen, we as humans can't process that. Mm -hmm. It just looks like a game. And, and you, you don't really feel anything from it as much because yeah. it's not real. Yeah, it's not real. That's very, like, that's physically real. <laughs> it's not real. No, that's very important. Yeah. <sighs> I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, I mean, regarding the it's not real, like, I, I remember 2022 before Luna Crash. So like, I remember telling, I remember being skiing in Switzerland with my parents because I'm from Switzerland, I would go there, you know, living the life because everything was up like crazy since two years. And I remember telling my dad, man, dad, I don't understand why people are so, give so much importance to money. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like. Yeah, because at the end of the day, money is just numbers on a screen, right? It's stupid. It doesn't make sense mm -hmm. because it's just, oh, I'm, I have more benefits in life and I'm more important and I'm more powerful because I have more number, I have one additional, 10 additional zero on a screen. It's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you, you think about money printing, the fact that banks can also basically print money. It makes no sense. True. But you were saying to me, Kevin, like you're basically completely disconnected to reality this money, these numbers represent something in reality. Like mm -hmm. with a certain amount, with 10 bucks, you can buy a pizza. Yeah. With a hundred bucks, you can buy 10 pizza. And that's the problem, the thing I hadn't realized. I was like, I was like, yeah, no, no, I still don't understand. It doesn't make sense, etc. cetera. Then, as you said before, these numbers are not in crypto. They're not real because they can, they can, uh, I had a guest the other day and he was telling me crypto, he's been in crypto also like you since 2013. Or I think maybe you've been even before. We talk about that later. And uh, he was telling me crypto is the best analogy is, is like a lottery. You're winning a lottery ticket tonight. So you made it. And the day after you lost the ticket. So you can't redeem your money. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. And I was Pretty like, cool. oh man, that's how not real it is. You know? Yeah. So it's, a, it's the guy who is co-founder of GSR. Okay, and, cool. Uh, uh, so yeah. it's called Alexi. And um yeah, anyway, so like a very good analogy. You've been in crypto since 2011, 12? Yeah, more or less. I feel like I really started to work in in 2015. Okay. Yeah. But you discovered crypto before that. Yeah. Can you tell us about your journey? Yeah. And so how did you end up even start there? Like, especially as an artist. 
yeah. someone <laughs> you're not a mathematician or well weirdly you know, I wasn't science. even I wasn't even doing the creative stuff back then it was 2011 ish and just a huge nerd I've always kind of distilled it down mm -hmm. to that everyone's always like how do you know this I'm like I, I I'm just a nerd and the computer and the internet has allowed me so much yeah information uh it's incredible that if i'm curious about one thing i could pretty much learn the whole concept if i just sat in front of a computer screen for however many how many hours or days right um and bitcoin was kind of coming up through kind of the the underground boards and you start reading about it and you're i just thought it was again like money printing and i was like ah oh, it's kind of a scam i don't really understand and then i used it once to buy uh i was in high school so i bought fake id and that okay. was how i bought it through the silk road um and it was early early days and had a bunch of bitcoin left over in a wallet and then forgot about it and then six months later it appreciated to however many dollars and at that age i think i was still 18 or 19 and i was like whoa what was this is this like is this it or and then it crashed back down <laughs> and then it kind of kept going and and really i started to just trade it and it was purely speculative but about 2014 came around i think and i feel like vitalik started to talk about ethereum a little bit more they talked about applications and to me bitcoin didn't make any sense because i didn't have a traditional finance background at all of course at that age um but applications made much more sense i think kind of the nerdiness and also just growing up in the digital age of internet mobile mm -hmm. all these applications and just the simple narrative of let's remove the inefficiencies of the middleman right and from there really started to see a lot of these fortune 100 500 clients i worked at a major agency in new york and they started talking about it that legitimized in my head and i said if the grown-ups are talking about it well then i think i might be onto something mm. and all of a sudden one thing led to another and when people asked about expertise about bitcoin and then ethereum a few years later i was the only person in the whole floor, maybe even the whole building who could articulate it better than anyone else in that building. And that to me was even a bigger signal and kind of chased that. And I was in a marketing function um, and then was at the agency and kind of worked on a little bit of blockchain and crypto uh, marketing there. And then in 2017, um, ended up getting hired as a head of marketing for a company called Fluidity. And that's Samir's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, just before that, what, what, why marketing if you're a nerd? Yeah, huge. Okay, so marketing, um, actually, the part that I skipped was I ran a music publication. And that's kind of where this all kind of comes together. The reason why I ran it um, was I worked as a golf caddy in in where I grew up in New York. And I was basically a rich people's bitch okay. the whole time. And I was very good at it. Because I, I think my <laughs> Japanese tiger parents like taught me to take things seriously, no matter how small or, or large, right? Yeah. And I was pushing so hard i'd go to the golf club at like five in the morning leave at like 8 p.m do like three rounds and then i realized i was capping out i was capping out at the time spent and there was no other vertical movement beyond what i've already done at 13 right age 13 to 18. i got really frustrated one time and i thought to myself well internet businesses is probably has a higher ceiling so let's try that i saw all these college guys writing blogs and so i just booted one up overnight wrote one and just started writing started to see it through friends of friends it was kind of the boom of social media and all of a sudden two three years later i had a million readers a year mm. when i look back i was wow. like well what led you to that continued yeah well there was a few complicated things there was one where i, I got the servers got dosed i booted up wrong like all this kind of like early mistakes um which was traumatizing at the time but you know i'm over it now but effectively i looked myself in the mirror and said what led to that success and it was really a lot of science point into digital marketing marketing mm -hmm. and then i was like oh my god it's so cool if i could kind of accidentally stumble into success almost with social media marketing what else could i do with this and then realize there's all these different channels there's actually strategy underlying instead of me just posting tweets or me posting facebook posts without really knowing what's up absolutely and then that's basically what led to marketing absolutely you know actually for this podcast we are I mean, everything is a science. All these social media is a science. And we're using AI and data analysis yeah. to help us script podcast questions. I mean, obviously, conversations are very organic, but there's a way to ask questions so that the answer is more likely to go viral in a short video clip. Yeah. And you want to uh, accumulate the millions of views because that's how you get the eyeballs and that's how you get the sponsorship and all that stuff. And, mm -hmm. and it's working really amazingly well. Like, just since we did all these changes, like, it's basically how do you train the algorithm 
to understand that you understood the algorithm. And obviously on different social media platforms, you have different algorithm, but it's all because now people consume mostly with short video clips and all that stuff. So I like, can yeah. focus on that. And uh, going through the last three months, really focused on that. And now we have like, yeah, some video clips with Irene Zhao, like doing like 2 million views and all that stuff. And it's all digital marketing and it's all understanding the science behind it. Yeah. It's just, and, and that's why Mr. Beast is so, is so, is so, exactly. is so, so amazing. He's just saying, I could start another YouTube channel without my name, without my face. And in six months I have 10 million subscribers because he knows, because he knows I the know game. exactly what yeah. goes viral and it's exactly. just the science of going viral every now and then. Yeah. And I think, I feel like part of it too, is a little bit of the competitiveness, competitiveness of, of my background. I grew up with a twin sister, told you already I have two Japanese parents. So that's already a lot mm. grew up in New York, which is hyper competitive just kind of like from a career's perspective, but also from when you're an up, when you're a child being brought up by your parents as well, it's pretty competitive just because of the finance world in New York City, of course. Um, and so kind of all that comes together and you look at it and say, okay, well, marketing is basically professional storytelling baseline. If your story doesn't hit, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. And then obviously it's not just one channel. And so it's multiple channels, even thousands of channels, you could argue. And with all that, then you have a huge land and it's like a game and you go, okay, well, what pieces can I be playing to make sure that that story lands with the opponent, for example, or, or the target customer in, in a more baseline way to, to view it. And so that part always is, to me, is so fun. It's, it's sort of a game, basically. Yeah. yeah. And crypto is like that too. And so it's music a little bit because the music scene also has nested kind of social layers too. And, and it also has marketing. If you think about crypto. it, you can break down anything, languages, music, probably photography, there is processes and ways that things work. Yeah. Obviously it makes everything less sexy because we all love a good story of like this person <laughs> got lucky and yeah. rich overnight or super successful and found. No, but it's not the truth. The truth is like consistency, hard work, understanding, oh, that's how this game, everything is a game. That's how this game is played. That's how I build a business. That's how I trade or invest. That's how I grow a following. That's how yeah. I do this and that. And, and then you just apply and apply and apply. And, and I, by the way, I don't care if it's sexy or not, because I'm a huge nerd anyways. So nothing was really that sexy to begin with. <laughs> and you just gotta like, keep going. <laughs> so marketing, head of marketing at 3DT. Yeah. And then, and then, so was there, so you met Samir, Samir Tabari is a previous guest on the podcast, the CEO of Bit Digital. Yep. Nasdaq listed my uh, Bitcoin mining company, who also a huge fan of Berlin. Yeah. And my life. There's a lot <laughs> I of see overlap. On Instagram all the time. There's a lot uh, of overlap like, in that man, scene. The guy's always in Berlin. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. He, and now he's now there, but, um, uh, so weirdly actually met that team totally cold. And then we bonded over music. Oh, I, and that's what classic one. Yeah, classic. Like us, you know, basically. No, like, honestly. Hey, the same. Yeah. Honestly, it was the same thing. And it was actually Oved is also one of uh, is the founder too. And and he and I bonded over cats. It was a cats and music. And, and then crypto was like a back background thing. And it was like, okay, I get we get that you know it. I don't it's care. Fine. But yeah. let's just figure out the personality and how you actually think. And they gave me a huge chance. Um, I think it was pretty competitive. And I remember I was like, okay, this is like total moonshot, but let's see. And and led that team to for about a few years. And then after that, um, the company got acquired. When that kind of happened, that was my kind of signal to say, okay, maybe there's an, an opportunity for new things. Mm. And then also another kind of really random situation. I talked to a bunch of different companies, but Ava Labs, uh, John Wu, president, he reached out to me on LinkedIn. Mm. Hey, I love all the stuff that you've been doing in the space. Um, obviously there's like 10 people in the industry at that moment. So it wasn't that hard to find someone, but, um, DM me and said, Hey, do you want to lead marketing for Ava labs? We're going to launch a new L1 called Aval. Um, it was called Ava actually at the time, but what now became avalanche and then kind of the rest is history from there. When was that exactly? Right after the right during COVID. So we went into lockdown, the company got acquired by consensus and then it was like a month later. So May, 2020. What's one of the biggest learning that you, that you learned in all these years in the crypto space? Um, as a builder and as yeah, an investor. So much, honestly, don't take things face value. That's, I think one of the main themes. Learned the hard way last year. Yeah. Uh, seriously. <laughs> like, and even then a lot I of nice sales, uh, sales guys. I learn every year, every year. And it humbles me all the time. And, and sometimes. 
I think to myself, well, didn't I tell myself that it was the last time I'd get kind of like duped by the the smoke and mirrors again? It's just we're just human at the end of the day. And if, you know, millions of people are looking at this and saying, hey, hey, this is it. This is it. You yeah, go, okay, it is it. We're human trying to build a momentum. And obviously when you build a momentum, you go a bit ahead of yourself, sometimes yeah. way too much. Yeah. And you end up in jail, like a few people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'm not doing anything there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's like the far extreme. That's even like way beyond. <laughs> you said last time we talked, nobody knows anything. Well, that too. Very similar, actually, similar guidance, right? Very Nobody similar. knows anything in that. That's why you have to not take things face value. It's like if someone comes and tells you they're a Bitcoin expert and there's a new uh, proposal on Bitcoin, it's like, take two steps back. Yeah, maybe they do. Doesn't matter. Take two steps back. Look at yourself. Look at the other pieces on the table. Talk to other folks. Really think about it. Mm. And even then you might still be wrong and that's okay. But at least... I don't know, the whole word of like aping into things, right? Let's not do that. Do you want to define that for people who don't know what it <laughs> yeah. means? Well, aping into I don't even something. know if I'm like the, <laughs> the Webster's Dictionary of Crypto at this point, but aping seems to have come out of just the crazy kind of dopamine chasing behavior that everyone in, or the OGs in crypto have or everyone in crypto's teams have, especially in a bull market. And so like a chimp or an ape would, you just kind of like without thinking, do that thing. Mm. And and you just ape into it, and that's kind of the so you see terminology. You see something that's starting to rise. You just jump into it, buy it, close your <laughs> eyes, hope for the best, and often get wrecked. Pretty much. <laughs> Even if the thing does a hundred x, then you're gonna hold it. Well, because it could until it could of course do a thousand x. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have a, I mean, we all have multiple stories like that. But I remember in 2020 being. Feeling like oh, I'm early in this uh, NFT thing. There was this uh, coin called Meme, so you could you could stake it and then you would earn farm pineapples, and then with these pineapples you could get some art pieces, so artworks. Yeah. So buy them with pineapples from like really cool artists, you know. And then you could either keep them if you like them, or you could resell them. And in the beginning of this kind of game, like you could, it was because it, it, there was only, for example, if, if the drop would be random. They, right. would, they would tell you only on Twitter, we're dropping now the new thing. So you always be like that, like waiting for it. And then you'd have maybe 10 pieces. So obviously would, within a few minutes, it would be gone or a few seconds at some point. Yeah. And then you could literally sell these for like one, two, three ETH, which ETH was probably 500 bucks. You could like basically get 1.5K by staking this meme coin, which was co literally called meme, getting this pineapple and then getting this card and selling it, right? And I remember was I was like, oh, I need to play this game, this game multiple times. So I'm going to buy enough meme coins to play the game like three, four times at the same time, you know? So yeah. because it was max five pineapple per day <laughs> for one meme token stake, something like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to buy a few, put like 3K into that. And then the thing went so crazy, the meme coin itself, like my meme coin, like became a hundred thousand bucks, yeah. which was like a bit less than a hundred ETH, which now is, is more and much more and at the top of the boom market, much more. And obviously you there, and it became like in three days. So it went from 3K to like a hundred K plus. And then I was like, oh man, obviously it's going to go to a million. So you, you just hold it. And then it went back down, like bubble crashed, like we all within like one week or 10 days, right. crazy thing. And I was like, oh man, fuck. I, uh, I fucked it up completely. So like my 3K was still 6K, but obviously you, you see the 100K that you didn't sell. So like you yeah. feel like you're a piece of shit and everything. But then I'm like, you know what? This thing is over. I'm going to sell at 6K. I'm still up 2X, but like I was depressed as fuck, yeah. obviously. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I'm going to ape in the next shit coin. To just make it all back. <laughs> exactly. Boom, ape in like within Classic like a couple strategy. of hours, down 50%, back to 3K. I'm like, fuck <laughs> sake, man. Don't play in this bullshit game. And um, I mean, a classic one and an example of aping in. Um, but isn't that funny? And then, and then, and then this meme coin, two months later, went back up, but like much more. Is, Obviously. But isn't it funny? Like that whole story that you just told, I tracked every single step of it. Tell that to anybody outside this room, anybody. They'd be like, so the how does the pineapple work here? Nonsense. There's pineapple? <laughs> Nonsense. You're, yeah. yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> 
<laughs> and this is probably like the middle of the road, like not even that bad of a reference. It's probably way. No, worse. it's not bad. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Right. It was after the the food uh, yeah. DeFi summer. Yeah, like, yeah. Up, uh, after, but like, like kind of like, obviously NFTs exist since earlier than that. But like kind yeah. of mainstream NFT stuff. Well, like, DeFi summer was the sushi exactly, like, drama. Exactly. It's like high school. Another another learning is like this all reminds me of high school. As long as you can. Uh, templatize the industry to high school, you're going to be good. You're going to navigate it pretty well. Don't get too like, you know, cocky and, and have a target on your back, but also understand their clicks, their clicks everywhere. And, and there's certain tribes that you want to be part of and you don't want to be part of. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, like in high school, things are really petty and kind of childish. Mm -hmm. So also understand that, right? And everyone's always like, yeah, it's totally like high school. And understand that most of it is manipulated. So even on social media, you have all these yeah likes and things like everything is bought you have all these bots right right so it's like, not even real be, yeah you, you you can actually be that's how they build momentum again like into a project yeah and that meta layer right there's the in-person uh kind of relationship building but there's also the online and the online is also like you signal certain things you you, you you're not necessarily your authentic self right mm -hmm. there's so many things i do on twitter that i would never do in person if we were solid face to face like like <laughs> it's like i don't do that right but in, in, in Twitter, you can actually signal socially and say, hey, like maybe it's a soft endorsement. That gets a little tricky too, especially with financial uh, instruments. What does the future of Avalanche look like? Right now, we are coming on a pretty intense few weeks. We just came from Korea. So we uh, had the second biggest event in Korea, second to KBW's actual conference. Mm -hmm. We had um, over a thousand people show up. We had a little over 2000 people registered. It was obviously a side event situation. So there's obviously a little bit of drop off. We're focused on a few things. I think the three primary things would be enterprises, Ava Cloud, which I'll get into in a second, and also Avasanch, which is that artist program. So really focus on NFT artists. The Ava Cloud product, full stop, is a fully, fully managed blockchain service. So if you are an enterprise and you want to boot up a blockchain solution, you don't actually have to hire a whole engineering team. You don't have to hire all that. You just go to Ava Cloud and say, hey, this, this is the solution that we need. Uh, and there's actually a front end and everything. And you can actually deploy blockchain in just minutes. Is Amazon or Microsoft doing something similar? Yeah, so Amazon does this, but they only support, I believe, Ethereum on the smart contract side. And I think they also support, uh, I forgot one other chain. I can't remember which one, but Ethereum is one of them. And so I think they're taking a different approach right now. And Ava Cloud would be multi-chain? No, we would focus on Avalanche under the hood, but the thesis is that we have such a performance stack of tooling that it's just better than what's out there. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think the other interesting advantage is the team that's building Ava Cloud also is building the Avalanche protocol. And so instead of a third-party managed service, like AWS is a good example, and not saying anything negative about those guys, but if they're building something for Ethereum, they, they are second to the Ethereum Foundation. The mm -hmm. Ethereum Foundation and the core devs know exactly what's going on and then they have to kind of react. We can kind of do one and the same much more quickly. So we might not see the benefits of it now per se, but I would say I think it's gonna uh, really be evident as we continue to validate the product um, and then the product should be going live very soon. Amazing, thank you for doing this, man. Yeah, that was awesome. In person, thanks for having me. Thank you.